Hello, listeners. This is Pat Healy here, welcoming you to another edition of the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. And on this edition, take note of Charlie Hall, the drummer for the War on Drugs, a band whose latest album, A Deeper Understanding, is up for a Grammy for the best rock album. And Charlie and I have a lot in common, not the least of which is a family whiskey sour recipe, which we do discuss a little bit in this podcast, but I edit out a lot of the details because this is a music podcast. If you want the actual recipe, you'll have to visit me at online.berkeley.edu slash take note and fill out the contact info. So obviously, Charlie and I spend most of our time discussing music, and he credits a grade school teacher named Mr. Denise with fostering his interest in music, and well, for providing a deeper understanding. Not surprisingly, Charlie Hall also credits the Beatles. My earliest memories would probably be Sgt. Pepper. My brother and sister are about, you know, nine and 11 years older than me. So from a very, very early age, uh, you know, there was, there was music being listened to in the house, you know, rock music. And, you know, my parents are a little older, so it wasn't, it wasn't coming from them, although, you know, they're both music fans, but, you know, my father was, was very much just like, he listened to pretty much Beethoven only. You know, there was no, like, they weren't of, like, uh, neither of my parents were really of a of a popular music um, generation. But my brother and sister were listening to, you know, my brother was listening to The Who and, and, and The Stones and, and Zeppelin and stuff like that. So that's, uh, you know, what another one, I, actually, I remember now my sister playing, my sister had a, had a 45 of, uh, of We Will Rock You. I knew it was music, but it also sounded like something else too, you know, because of the, you know, the, the percussive elements, like, you know, I was like, are these people like all banging on, like, what is that? It's not drums. You know, it's like, I remember just feeling like it it sounded so foreign to me. So I, I think I kind of always, and then my sister was listening to the cars and I, and I loved how much that sounded like something that was sort of from outer space. Uh, just as a little, as an impressionable, you know, five-year-old or whatever, um, you know, that, I think that stuff really kind of, kind of hit me. So, those are some of my earliest memories. And then it really, then it was really all about. It was, it was about like a few records. Like it was about the Rolling Stones, Hot Rocks. That was, you know, like Honky Tonk Woman. That, that was when I, you know, realized I think I wanted to play drums. It was like listening to that song with that cowbell intro, and that's kind of. That's sort of how it really started. My grandmother gave me uh, like a Muppet Show toy drum set, I think, when I was about four. And I'd like add on to it with with pots and pans and try to make like little extra toms for it and, you know, expand it. And then I then I got a real drum set, I think, when I was about six for uh, for Christmas. That's great. And so that's when it all started, yeah. It's, it's interesting. You, you and I have a bit more in common than just the Whiskey Sours, I guess, because my, my siblings are uh, <laughs> 9 and 10 years older than I, I am, and and all the uh, groups you mentioned were pretty much what they were listening to, especially the Cars. Yeah. Now tell me this. Uh, with, with, with your siblings, uh, mine were loose guides to me for music, but then... You know, my interest eclipsed their interest in music by the time I became like ten or twelve. But were were your uh, siblings guides for you, or or did your interests outweigh theirs? Eventually, well, yeah, my brother was was and always has been very much a guide. You know, for me like that, like as as he grew, you know, out of his middle school classic rock phase. You know, mm-hmm. he 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 grew into like a very heavy sort of talking heads, REM uh, sort of thing. And, you know, this was the days of like WLIR. Like we, so we, my brother and I moved away with my mom to Connecticut, you know, and so we, we were kind of huddled, huddled up a lot, you know, I think because of that, you know, he was uh, maybe, maybe uh, 14, you know, and I, I'd have been five or six, Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think because of that, because of the sort of uh, 
because of that, those circumstances, we, we definitely like sort of bonded together and, and yeah, I definitely was, you know, whatever his records were, I was, I was always stealing them and, and, and listening to them. And, and, but yeah, like there was this, I, I remember this very sort of defining moment where like, where I started to branch off into my own, you know, by the time I was like, you know, nine or 10, it wasn't all just like all of his stuff. Like I started to get really interested in U2 mm -hmm. and uh, that was kind of like my thing, mm -hmm. you know, rather than his thing. And then same with like the same with Pink Floyd and, and the Grateful Dead. Those were both like things that he wasn't really as interested in. And so those, those sort of became like my, my things. I always like sought his approval, you know, on everything. And, but I, I definitely remember like, you know, when I, when I sort of, when my interest really like veered towards, towards those things, particularly those three bands, particularly the Grateful Dead, Pink Floyd, and U2, um, that I, that I was like, you know, that I was like stepping out on, you know, like our, our shared, uh, interests. Right. I, I remember I, I had a similar thing. My brother came home from college and he found like my Sex Pistols record and my Cure staring at the sea. And he was just like, Sid Vicious is a loser, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he was disappointed. Music. Yeah, he was disappointed. But it also, it was one of those things where it's like, this is my thing. This is, you what, know, it's kind of... What were, his, what, were your, what were your brother's like pantheon of bands? He had, well, he brought home from college that first year, R.E.M. Murmur and U2 mm -hmm. Boy. And um, I was already pretty headlong into U2. But, yeah. you know, when, when you had to buy the stuff, like you couldn't just stream it. Right. It, it took more resources that I didn't have. So it, that was, you know, great. But I think he was just kind of unnerved by the fact that I was getting into things without his, you know, gateway I know. I think it's like, I'm very, I can totally relate to that. I think that probably, you know, I think my brother probably felt the sort of the same way. Like he was, he was just, you know, he was very much like my father figure too, in a way, even though like he's also my brother. Right. You know? And, and so I think, yeah, I think he was kind of like, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I totally remember it. Like I, I remember bringing home Delicate Son of Thunder, like that live Pink Floyd record, you know? And he's like, what is this, man? It's not even like really Pink Floyd. I'm like, yes, it is. You know? Plus, you know, I was like, 12 or whatever, however old I was and, and, you know, 13. I totally remember his, like, disapproval. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so you find you find your own interests and you find your own voice. And, and had you been playing with any family members or who, who were you playing with? No, no one in my family played, no one in my family really played an instrument. Like, but I was, you know, fortunate that, you know, we had a piano in the house. And, you know, I had drums and my brother had a guitar. He had an acoustic guitar under his bed that he, you know, played for a little bit, but didn't really, you know, didn't really stick with it. So there was also a guitar in the house. So that's kind of like my, honestly, like my, my musical sort of training was just teaching myself how to play these, you know, teaching myself how to play these things, listening to his records, you know, and my records, like just learning, you know, like I learned guitar mostly by, you know, listening to Led Zeppelin records and, and figuring out, you know, chords. You know, I bought, I bought a chord book, you know, just kind of pieced it together. And same with piano. Like, I took a couple of lessons when I was, you know, seven or eight and didn't stick with it because, you know, I just didn't have the discipline or patience or whatever. So I, but I was really into, you know, I've always really been interested in chords and, and harmony and, you know, that kind of thing. So I just kind of taught myself same thing. I just sort of, once, once I figured out, you know, the basics of scales and, and, you know, chord structures, I just kind of, uh, pieced it together myself, you know, which is why I'm a total hack. At <laughs> <laughs> when, when was the first time you started playing with other people? So I went to, I went to the school for, I went to the same school for 13 years. Okay. It was kindergarten through 12. So one, one byproduct of that was that, you know, the, I, I was around older kids. Like I, there, there was, you know, there was access to older kids. So like when I was in, you know, fourth or fifth grade and, you know, I was like, you know, I was the only kid that played drums really in the school. And so I, I was like, I got to play with, you know, 
high schoolers and stuff because they needed a drummer and you know i was this little monkey kid who could you know keep a beat or whatever so i i got so there was this thing every year there was a like a variety show like a talent show and so i feel like that was like one of the things that really like framed my years was like what band am i going to put together and what for this thing you know it was like the big the big show every year so it was like really like a lot about you know starting in in probably fifth grade was the first year where it wasn't where it wasn't like a lip sync thing but where i was actually like putting together bands and we'd you know learn three songs and play for this like variety show and you know the guy you know mr denise was the was like he was like the dean of students and it was like his big show and he just was always so supportive like every year like all the way through high school he was just like he really just kind of like what's it going to be this year his his tagline was boom he'd be like boom charlie hall what's it going to be this year you know it's like just always like really encouraging me with in terms of you know playing music and 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 that kind of thing it was really like that was a big uh formative kind of annual thing for me that's great does does he know how influential he was you know it's just as i was just saying that i was like man i gotta reach out to him i mean i think he does but you know just like any guy i i I should tell you know i should i should remind him i'm sure he knows i mean he was like a really special amazing person and and you know i think he was probably really influential for a lot of people in, in a lot of different respects but um yeah, you know, I'm gonna like when 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 we finish this up, I'm gonna figure out how to reach out to him. He's not at the school anymore, but he's he's definitely around, and and I'll I'll find him. He was uh, he's a pretty amazing guy. That's great. Do you, do you remember the first three songs you did, or the first songs you did with the group? Yeah, Sunday Bloody Sunday. <laughs> oh, dude, you have no idea. Is it really? It had, I mean, I'm we, just trying. To we had it. Sunday Bloody. We had Sunday Sunday Bloody Sunday in the back pocket. But what we actually did for the show, we were called Exit 18 because that's where that was the the um, exit off of I-95 to get to the school. We did Message in a Bottle. Yeah. And we did Bad by You Too. Oh wow! We, okay. We, we had we had Sunday Bloody Sunday in the back pocket, but we did Bad. Yeah. And because uh, uh, yeah, Kelsey Libner, the guitar player, had a delay pedal, and he was figured out how to do that that edge stuff. Wow, I was gonna say that that's high tech for for that age. The the delay. Pedal. Yeah, I mean those guys were probably like eighth grade. I was I was in fifth grade. Those guys were like eighth graders. They were a little that we had we had. Uh, Tofi Dawson on a Juno 106. I mean, looking back on it, yeah, it was pretty. That was a, it was a pretty sweet little little lineup with with some sweet gear, which I'm sure nobody has anymore. But you know, we did a guy playing a Juno, uh, Anthony D'Alto on bass, Tim Hotchner on second keyboards. So these are the formative years, and and when do you realize that this is something more than just? I mean, well, I guess at some level you must have realized it because it was a thing you looked forward to all year. Yeah, and I mean, I just always like when I'd come home from school, I'd just play music like until my stepfather came home. I mean, I'd get home from school and I'd put on headphones and I'd play along with like, you know, album sides for for hours, you know, until like seven o'clock. You know, like my mom always encouraged me to do that, and my brother always encouraged me. I mean, our house was like two hundred years old. It was like our house was made out of like plywood. I mean, you could hear. It, there, it was loud. It was louder than you could possibly imagine. But my family was was so encouraging, and you know, endured what probably sa- what sounded amazing in my ears because I had headphones on, listening to you know Zeppelin IV, thinking that I was you know John Bonham. But you know, I'm sure it sounds like holy hell in the house. You know. So I guess I get you know I always you know it was always a thing. I just I didn't know like what what shape music would take in, in you know my professional life but i think i probably always knew since i was you know 3 or 4 years old that music was going to be like the guiding the guiding force in my life you know i i went to college and and i did study music i studied music history and music theory i wasn't like a performance major or anything like that i i think i i kind of always like my dream job actually was always sort of like 
you know, I loved school as a kid. I just like, I loved the rhythm of, of the school year. And I, and I had it like, I, I had a really great experience. Like I loved my, my friends and my teachers. So I think I always kind of wanted, like my dream job was to like teach music in a school in some capacity, you know, like not necessarily like being a band leader or being like the choir director, but you know, like teaching, teaching music theory and, and stuff like that. Where'd you go to school? I went to school in Virginia in Williamsburg uh, at college of William and Mary. Oh, okay. Again, like following my brother. Cause my brother went there. <laughs> wow. So kind of like, Another thing. I, I followed my brother. You did not. Yeah, it was the worst mistake I ever made. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Okay, so you're at William & Mary, and are you yep. playing in bands there? Yep, playing in bands. You know, not, not like not like the, the college band, but like just playing in, in bands, playing in rock, in rock bands and stuff like that. What uh, what kind of stuff are you guys doing? What, what are the names? I always like to hear people's the names of their oh, God. bands. Oh, embarrassing names. You know what I mean? Like jam band names. Like I don't even, I actually, I think I've like blocked them out. I think I've, I've sort of done like some sort of like, they're probably in there somewhere, but you know, probably something like the something, something project or like, you know, so-and-so's, you know, whatever, just insert idiotic string of names here. And you have probably in the ballpark, you know, gotcha playing like, yeah, it's kind of, um, I mean, I was I was really interested in, in jazz, but, you know, also like a classic rock kid. So, you know, the sort of logical extension of, of that, you know, at that time in the late 80s, early 90s was like, you know, get like this stuff that kind of came out of the blender sounding like, you know, jammy noodle mm-hmm. n- noodle fest. Were you always the drummer or were you doing um, No, sometimes, I, you know, I played a lot of guitar. I mean, so starting around age you know, eight or nine, I got myself to the, to the point where I could, I could play the guitar pretty well. I peaked early at all this stuff. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I what I, what I do now, I've been, been doing since I was like 12, <laughs> but, uh, not totally true, but yeah, so sometimes guitar, sometimes, you know, got into playing more and more keyboards, like after college when I was in San Francisco and, you know, I, I, bought a Wurlitzer and, you know, I was like the guy with a Wurlitzer. So it was like able to kind of, you know, I could play with a bunch of people who, you know, needed that flavor and, you know, I can, you know, literate enough to sort of fake my way through most scenarios. That seems to be the the lesson so far is be the guy with the instrument that nobody else is doing. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a great there's, there's some advice for your uh, for your students. Yeah. That's great. Take up the take up the English horn. <laughs> <laughs> but um so you moved to San Fran after college and mm-hmm. yeah, my wife and I uh, moved out there kind of the summer after college we worked worked for a couple of months to make enough money to to get out there and and pay first month's rent and uh you know, and we planted our roots out there and they got pretty deep, you know, and, and we made the, made the really hard decision to leave there, you know, after about eight years when, when it was kind of like, we're either there forever because, you know, we loved it and, and our kind of extended family was, was, was getting, getting really deep out there. But, you know, our, our real family is all back East and, you know, our parents were older and we're like, right. you know, so we, we, we moved to Philly. What was the first song you guys danced to at your wedding? Uh, I had a uh, good question. I had uh, some friends of mine assemble a band. They played Hold On by Tom Waits off of Mule Variations. Oh, cool. That's great. Yeah, I love that song. So it's back to San Fran for a little bit. Yes. Yeah. You're play, you're playing there, and are you mm-hmm. doing that to make a living? Yeah, I was playing at night, teaching it during the day. So it was a lot of like when I was in San Francisco, it was mostly um, mostly playing either straight ahead jazz gigs in sort of trio quartet quintet form, or after a while, um, for a few years, put together this this sort of bigger band that was doing like the Bitches Brew era Miles um, tunes, you know, like mm-hmm. everything from like In a Silent Way through Agarta, just sort of exploring those 
you know, loosely sort of exploring those figures, which would be like, I mean, you know, the head would be like a eight bar phrase or something. And most of those tunes were like actually defined by like certain rhythms, you know, as much, as much as they were defined by any sort of changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them didn't really even have changes. They were just, you know, modal things that, um, so that was really, that, that was a, sort of one of the, that's probably like one of the most formative, that particular project was, was, you know, I joke about not, not having improved since I was 10 years old, but like that, that was actually, actually the first time that I, you know, really like kind of broke through, um, to another level in terms of like my, my playing and my, my understanding of, of, both of harmony and you know, but also of just you know, playing drums. When you're teaching, what 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 grade level are you teaching? It was a high school, very similar to the one I went to. So it was one of these schools that where I got to do a lot of different things, which was really cool. And they they really like entrusted me with different different projects. And you know, I was I worked in the college counseling office as a college counselor. I was this is going to sound crazy, but I was the the ninth and tenth grade dean of students for a year, which was a, another really great experience. And I was teaching the jazz band. And uh, taught ninth grade history. Wow! So they, they had, wore a lot of different hats there. And yeah, that was another real, real, you know, defining experience for me. That's amazing in my life. And you know, really, I, I mean, as it relates to everything, you know, being in a band, and um, I mean, so was for for that matter. I mean, bussing tables when I first moved to San Francisco. I mean, I learned as much bussing tables that has kind of prepared me for, you know, for this life. As mm-hmm. as any as anything you know as any as any music teacher I've ever had you know just because it's about you know you just it's it's about everything it's about you know being in a band is is about how you relate to other people and and how you you know all all the all the different things that go into this 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 whole this whole process you know mm-hmm. making sense of everything and and putting things in order and and kind of keeping keeping different different uh, irons on the fire and yeah I, I think everybody should work in a restaurant at some point in their life I think that if you ever think that you don't have anything to learn it's it's you know it's all over right <laughs> I mean right. You know, I mean I'm gonna be learning hopefully you know for the rest of my life I mean that's it's that's one of the things that you know, I'm learning, you know, you learn every day. I mean, something, you know, even, you know, I was actually talking about this with, with the guys in the band that are opening for us on this tour who are dear, dear friends, but they were, you know, like watching our sound check and they were, it was cool. They were really inspired by the fact that we were like sort of like picking apart a song that we've played, you know, hundred, literally hundreds of times. Like we've mm-hmm. a song we've probably played like 400 times in the last couple of years. And, mm-hmm. but for, for some reason, for whatever reason, we were like picking it apart yesterday, trying to, trying to crack some crack open something new. in this one part. And, the, and those guys were, yeah, I guess it, it ended up being like sort of inspiring to them to like, to watch us sort of going through that. It's like, yeah, it didn't really occur to me that it was anything special or unique, but you know, they, they it really, I guess, you know, it really like sort of made an impression on them to see us, doing that i thought it was cool what tune was it um under the pressure oh yeah which is um, it's kind of become like a you know it's like a, it's definitely a moment in the set you know like i i think that it's a song will probably play for a long time because it's you know in uh, in addition to just being incredibly fun to play it's it's sort of one of the tunes where things just open up and 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 something something new happens every day mm-hmm. you know and you know, some songs are very, you know, everything is, is highly composed and some, some songs kind of have, have moments that reveal themselves, you know, the more you play them. Right. Uh, what's the name of the opening band? They're called Low Moon, L-O-M-O-O-N. Uh, Matt, Matt Lowell was, uh, he's the, he's the, the leader of that gang and, and, um, he is, uh, they're, they're an amazing band. He, Matt's a, Matt's a Berkeley alum. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, he was he was supposed to be a hockey player, and he uh, 
you know, like went to one of these schools where, you know, like up in New Hampshire or whatever, where you, where you like play ice hockey and that was his, his whole trip. And, and he had this moment where he, uh, you know, had an epiphany of sorts and he told his coach he was going to Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, those guys are incredible. Their, um, their record is going to be out in February on Columbia. And, oh, wow. um, they, they, yeah, yeah, they have a couple, they have, there's a couple singles out that you can check out. They're, uh, really pretty, pretty special, special gang. So in San Francisco, is that where you met Adam? Cause he, he had a, a stint out there too, right? Yeah, no, it's funny. We, we had strangely parallel sort of, uh, migrations. He, he was in Oakland for a bit. Um, I didn't know him out there, but we both got to San Francisco and uh, we both got to Philadelphia in 2003. Mm-hmm. and met shortly thereafter um i was playing some bands and so was he and you know we used to just see each other you know on the on the scene you know at the kyber or whatever that's where everyone used to play yeah and uh and then that was when he he really started putting together this this thing that is the war on drugs you know so it all kind of started to started to come together and you know couple of years after we both got to Philly. Yeah. So when, when that's coming together and you moved to Philly mm-hmm. for just to move back East to be near the family. Yeah. yeah. Just to be closer to family, close, but not too close, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> oh, and also my brother, my brother lived in Philly. So I was just following him around again. <laughs> so what, um, what, what are you doing for work at that point? So at that point I'm uh, touring more, so I, fi- I figured out a way to sort of stay in. I always loved having it both ways. You know what I mean? Like that was like, that was my thing. Like that I loved, I think that one, I think that really like my appreciation for music just continued to grow because I like had, had the job that, you know, kept was, kept me around the school, but I also like had the music thing. And so I figured out a way when I moved to Philly that I could keep touring, which I had started doing uh, towards the end of my time in San Francisco, playing with a guy named Tommy Guerrero. Um, We used to go to Japan a lot and do stuff. So I was working when I moved to Philly at uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, like in school-based programming. So I was like directing, mentoring programs in schools, but I didn't have like a classroom that I had to be in every day. So I could kind of come and go if I needed to be away for a month for a tour. They were so, they were so supportive of me and and sort of allowed me to have this scenario where I could, you know, come back and still have my job. You know, Mm -hmm. it was really, really so grateful for that, uh, that time in my life and just also for that experience. That's great. And and so you have, Friended Adam and Kurt probably mm-hmm. by this point, and mm-hmm. right. And uh, it, it's interesting. I, I love stories where the origins of a band have, you know, a, a more than one central character, and they go off and do different things. And and did did you always know? Was, was it like a, a loose affiliation, and and you always knew Kurt was going to go do his own thing? Or I mean, in you and well, Kurt, always, too. Kurt always kind of yeah. I mean, Kurt always had his own thing. You know, and Adam always had his own thing. It's just, it's understandably, I think, kind of hard for people to wrap their heads around it because, you know, it's like at at the core, it was like the war on drugs was Adam and Kurt. Right. And and Kurt Vile was Kurt and Adam. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's confusing. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, Dave Dave was around from the very early days, um, Dave Hartley. But yeah, it was like, you know, and then, you know, when, when Mike Zangi was playing drums, like he was Kurt's drummer and he was also the drugs drummer, you know, it's like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of confusing overlap for people. I think, even though to me, they're so different, Uh like those, those two projects. And I know on some level people, you know, associate them together and that's, that's cool too. But like to, to my you know, to my ear, like they're, they're, they're on scratching away at like totally different things. Right. Right. You know, both awesome, but you know, like Adam's, what Adam's, you know, kind of scratching away at is, is, you know, definitely, you know, different than, than what, what, what Kurt's after. Right. So you began 
as the drummer for War on Drugs. Then you weren't the drummer for War on Drugs for a little while, and then now now you're back in the fray. Is is that correct? You know, like in 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 the in the early days of the band, there was a you know a, a very kind of a large cast of characters that were that were sort of in the in the orbit of the band, and um, you know I was one of those people and and uh, kind of come and go and played played uh, as things were were getting going and then um, you know then then those guys kind of took off and and ran around the world for you know for years and then and then I kind of was was loosely part of the you know still part of that extended family and you know sometimes I'd be playing drums but sometimes I'd play keys and guitar you know just depending on what was uh, what was needed at the time and then you know when we were making the last record lost in the dream was when you know things things became a little more more full time you know and then you know ever since we've been uh, it's been i don't know i guess that was 2013 2014 you know and we've been really busy ever since they went off and and um have you know had had a few different drummers over the years and you know they went out and really did the grind and and just pounded the pavement you know like drove around and 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 really just started building this this thing that that now is you know just kind of kind of snowballed into into you know where where we're at today but you know opening for Opening for bands and and running around doing doing small sort of headline shows and you know sometimes it was great and sometimes it was you know sometimes it was not but you know you learn from you hopefully learn from every every gig you play you know like what works and what doesn't or you know how to how to be resilient you know if 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 something doesn't go right or you know how to how to push through and and make things you know take things to to the next level mm-hmm. and, and would you go see them when when you weren't in the band oh yeah always yeah you know i mean i still you know i still sort of can appreciate this band as you know as adam's friend mm-hmm. and as a as a fan as much as like someone who's involved in it you know and i'm i'm, I'm grateful to be involved in it and i and i love it and it's i feel like everything musically and otherwise that I've done in my life has kind of prepared me for this, this gig specifically. Like, I mean, I, I really, really love this music and I, I love like what Adam's going for and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and I love the people. So it's like, I wouldn't do this otherwise. You know what I mean? Like if I, if I wasn't with people that I loved and playing music that I love, you know, I'd rather, rather be home you know like I've, I've got a family and, and i'm a homebody but this is something that you know i really truly love and and uh so i yeah i've always i've always been a been a a super duper uh cheerleader for for this band and, and for adam that's great and, and how did it come to pass that you did join up full time what, like, what were you doing right in that period before that? Just touring with different acts? Mm, yeah, but touring, yeah, playing with a guy named Jens Lechman oh, yeah. um, from Sweden and a um, band called Windsor for the Derby, um, which was a fellow secretly Canadian band. That's the label that, that we used to be on. Right. So, yeah, just playing with lots of different people and, you know, just trying to learn and grow in, in each, you know, different scenario and and recording with lots of different bands and just trying to keep uh keep getting better you know Mm -hmm. and then when we made the last record we were you know uh did did some shows and and then you know when it came time to put together the the sort of new version of the band which is you know the way it's been ever since uh you know we just kind of it was like it just was seemed like it was time, you know. Mm-hmm. Adam was like, "Can we just do this?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, we can just do this." <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. So, so it was. So uh, it's, that, it, it's interesting because I was gonna kind of get to that. Is is it feels like a lot of people were in the orbit, and then somebody said, "All right." let's put this all together and figure out the lineup that works best and stay with that. And, right. 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 It's like, let's just do this. Like this is, this, this feels great. And it's, it's just a, 
it's an amazing group of musicians and everyone plays every instrument, which is interesting. I mean, not on stage, but I think that like, that's something that is, is a little unique about this, this band and, and something that I think is, is definitely is a part of, part of understanding each other is that, you know, everyone in this band plays drums and everyone in this band plays guitar and everyone in this band plays keys Mm -hmm. And so I think that really sort of helps, you know, helps the, the, the conversation mm -hmm. when you're both, you know, in, in, in overt ways, but also in, in more sort of subtle ways and just in terms of understanding what each other's doing or helping each other actually with, with, with specific things. How does the process work? Because, I mean, there's such, there's so many elements of this band that make it compelling whether it's you know a lot of the draw for me is the soundscape nature mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then and then there's the songs which which are mm -hmm. they they function on a different level than the soundscape mm -hmm, quality mm -hmm. for sure so I, i'm just wondering about how you guys develop each song as the way it sounds yeah i mean it's really hard to say you know like it's it they sort of happen in, in different ways. I mean, I think that maybe more so than ever, some of, the, you know, the, with the new record, like these songs did uh, develop first as songs as opposed to starting as landscapes and then, um, and then the song sort of building out of that. Mm -hmm. But to be, to be honest, it's like, it's, it's such a blurry line that it's it's kind of both mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it is interesting i agree with you like it's, it's kind of compelling because it's just part of adam's process that and it's 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 really unique and it, these things there is an element of you know starting from just finding a, a mood and like finding trying to find this space that you know for for in which a, a particular song can can uh can grow you know, it's, it's Adam's really, you know, I think more than ever, like his, his, um, really found his voice like on, on the synth and, and finding, um, sort of sculpting, um, landscapes with various, you know, synthesizers and, and things like that. Um, in addition to just, you know, people always think of him as a guitar player and, and he is, you know, he has turned into, you know, a ripping, ripping guitar player, but it's, it's also like, his his whole you know this this whole thing is you know it's his brain you know like i mean i think that's one of the things that makes this so successful is like there's a very sort of clear axis upon which everything kind of rotates and 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 that's you know comes comes directly from him right and, and that seems also probably pretty important with the way you play as far as you know I, i've played with a number of people and a number of drummers and <laughs> Some of them aren't mm -hmm. secure enough or confident enough to just keep a, like a, a regular beat, and they want to do it too interesting, yeah. and and it requires, I'd imagine, some restraint. Yeah, it requires a lot of restraint, and you know, that's it's something I enjoy personally, you know, and um, I, I I enjoy kind of um, trying to find that very delicate balance between holding holding things down and letting. Letting the sonics do the, do a lot of the layering and and dynamic building, mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of like your typical like we're gonna swell into this section with a big fill and it's gonna be this and do a do a fancy this and that. It's it's kind of letting letting some of the other elements do a little more of that than more so than like your your typical pop song drum thing. It's more yeah. like German German in a, an approach in a way, you know like. It's interesting though if you look at the well first of all congrats on the Grammy nomination. Thanks. Yeah. But if if you look at the other bands in that category <laughs> they those drummers like try to be like they they switch the song structure by switching the drum parts and, yeah. and whereas you talk about uh, well I mean you know much respect especially to John Theodore but yeah totally different thing you know. Who are the other bands? Metallica. So yeah, <laughs> Mastodon. Nothing more. Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah. 
Yeah, very, very different vibe. I'm, you know, I'm glad we're recognized as a, as a rock band, though. To be honest, yeah, you know? I think that's, I think that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea what, what, what uh, any of that stuff really means. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. but it's great, and you know, it's something for my mom to talk about at the dog park. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> Does she go to the dog park? Yeah, she's got two, uh, two dogs, Portuguese water dogs. So. Tell me a little bit about the uh, Silver Ages project. Well, yeah. So actually, like under underlying throughout this whole thing, this goes back to like my experience as a kid making music. Like something that I was always um, I always loved is is you know singing and and close harmony uh, in particular. I've always been like a fan of that style of singing, like the Mills Brothers or Ink Spots. You know, that kind of like four freshmen type of thing, which obviously was like a huge you know part of like the beach boys thing you know the four freshmen specifically and so like in in a a lot of the music that i love i mean i've always i've always been a huge fan of of vocal harmony and stuff like that and so when i've moved to philly like one of the things that was so cool about about that town was just like and this goes back to what i was saying before how like adam and i used to see each other at you know each other's gigs and and bands just like really especially like I'm, I know this still goes on. I, I feel a little, a little detached from the sort of like the scene on the ground in Philly, and not home a lot. But I put together guys like sort of fig- figured out that I had this like sneaky like choral history, uh-huh. like of like directing choirs and stuff. And so I um, kind of just pulled together like eight friends from different bands of dudes that were just like interested in singing more you know like just learning maybe like learning to sing better or but more the so than i was just like an excuse to get together and like make music that was kind of strange to er, foreign to everyone equally like you know like they none of none of them had any like experience you know singing like close harmony stuff that i have libraries full of uh, older men's choral choral arrangements and it just turned into like a thing it's like it's just something to do like nobody's we're not selling merch we're not trying to sell records we're not like even we do one show a year just for fun for like our friends but like just literally like making music for the sake of making music Mm -hmm. you know and and like so that's what it really became and now it's 17 of us and we've been doing it for 12 years wow um we just get together every couple weeks at my house around the piano and you know, sing incredibly complex <laughs> choral arrangements and drink t- a little too much, you know? <laughs> it sounds really good. And I was very nervous before I investigated it that it would be like rock cappella type stuff. Oh, but- God. Yeah, I tried so hard to shield those guys from like <laughs> knowing about this like seedy underbelly of like what's happened to that fraternal style, you know, because I, I grew up like near New Haven. So I, I, and my, my mentor, uh, growing up was actually like the athletic director at my school who was in those Yale singing groups, you know, like the Yale Alley Cats right. and the Whiff and Poofs and stuff. And so I kind of grew up like appreciating that the very sort of old traditional style, like the sort of folk based, almost sort of barbershop based, you know, style of close harmony singing. But then, yeah, so I like tried desperately to like shield these dudes from knowing that there's this whole unsavory world of like, <laughs> college singing groups doing like beatboxing and singing singing, like red hot chili pepper songs it's like the most dreadful thing imaginable and then of course like glee happened and all this stuff like after we started doing this stuff like they they started to be like oh there's a show you know on tv i'm like yeah yeah i know i know there's a show on tv like (laughs) you know like they're just like slowly starting to figure out that there's like this whole world but um we're we're uh, as far away from that that universe of as possible. Stay there. <laughs> oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> what what kind of um, musical interaction do you have with your kids? My younger son. Well, a, a lot. You know, I mean, there's music on all the time in the house, and um, my older son um, discovered Weird Al. Oh wow! A few years ago, and and I saw that for the first time, music kind of becoming a thing for him because of Weird Al, mm-hmm. which is really neat. You know, like he, um, just because of the humor of it, you know, he just, he just, just loves it. And it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like he doesn't really even know 
what the songs are parodying, mm -hmm. but like he just loves the, you know, it's, it's great. And then my younger son is, it's like his relationship with music is a little different because it's like very, it's very natural. And he just is like, so, so he, he's very into, you know, like he plays piano and he's actively sort of a, a music listener. You know what I mean? Hmm. More so than, yeah. It's just, so he's just super, super into it. Loves, um, well, yeah, they, they love, they love when the dudes come over and, and sing. They, they, they both, um, like to kind of like sit at the top of the steps and like listen to us sing these songs. And now my younger son has started to like ask for a folder of his own so he can kind of read along because he can read music now. So he kind of like, you know, it's, it's like, kind of with us in terms of like, he's like reading along and, you know, even though he's only, he's only seven, he's like kind of pretends like he's, he's doing it with us. It's kind of, kind of cool. It's really, um, I'm grateful that to have that experience, you know, with my friends getting to have, have my son's experience that music is it's just something that can bring people together. And, and, you know, like those relationships with those dudes, with those 17 guys, I mean, they'd be my friends anyway, but like, because we do this thing that's like such a crazy adventure, like we, you know, it just keeps those relationships are so those bonds between us are so strong and it's, it's all, it really is. It's because of the music and because we're doing this thing together. So I'm, I'm really glad that my sons can see how music is just something that is a connector. And, you know, it's music's been a connector for me my entire life going back to like, that's how, I made friends when I was a little kid because, you know, it was like playing music together or just talking about music. It didn't necessarily have to be playing music. It's just music is something that, you know, this, this, this shared experience that, that we have and can have with people. And so the fact that like my sons get to kind of see that is, is means, means so much to me. Boom, Charlie Hall. I couldn't resist a Mr. Denise callback there. Anyway, Charlie Hall summing up quite eloquently the shared experience of music and its bonding powers. Be sure to tune in to the Grammy Awards on Sunday, January 28th on the CBS Network. Also, be sure to keep an eye out and an ear out for a brand new podcast coming soon from Berkeley Online. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you soon.